Hello and welcome to the Things Conference Agricultural Track. My name is Tom Zamir and in this presentation I will be talking to you about optimizing LoRaWAN for agricultural deployments in rural areas and high density plantation crops. But first a few words about IoT experts. We build IoT solutions that are driven by technology and are designed for growth with our consultancy services, monitoring and connectivity products, and project management expertise, we leverage the power of IoT to build innovative agricultural and environmental solutions. Some of our recent projects include Satura AG, we design, implemented, and manage a global LoRaWAN system for them. With SolChip, we're working on their new solar-powered LoRaWAN sensor and valve controller. For Rack Wireless, we provide AgTech know-how and product design advice. With Autonomous Pivot, we design and implement LoRaWAN in their IoT Edge systems. As you know, LoRaWAN was originally designed for urban environments and smart cities. But over the years, it became a sought-after long-range radio technology in many verticals, including AgTech. In this presentation, we will explore some of the architectural issues with LoRaWAN presents for a successful AgTech deployment and how to overcome them to achieve success. So what are some of the assumptions of the original LoRaWAN network architecture and design? Multiple gateways per deployment. Gateways are dumb, acting only as data tunnels. Gateways have stable network connectivity with low latency, preferably wired. Gateways have a stable power supply. End devices are simple sense and transmit devices. Hundreds or thousands of devices per deployment. Used for non-critical, medium to low latency applications. What are some of the realistic specifications and needs of a rural AgTech deployment? Single gateway per site, intermittent network connection on cellular uplink with high latency, solar power or unstable local power supply, and devices with multiple sensors, valve controls, and advanced built-in logics, few to dozens at most devices per deployment, the season support systems, alerts and monitoring, and low latency irrigation systems are some of the applications used. So if we compare the two, we can quickly see that they do not correlate. So is LoRaWAN a good long fee RF stack solution for AgTech deployments in the rural area and high plant density locations? Can LoRaWAN communicate irrigation and soil water potential data from your avocado trees? Can LoRaWAN support soil moisture and irrigation monitoring of your walnut trees? in the winter and in the summer? Can LoRaWAN be utilized to transmit sensor data in center pivot fields in rural areas for long ranges too? The answers to these questions is yes, but some modifications have to be done to the stack for it to work. And this is a good time for a little disclaimer. Any of the suggestions discussed in the next few sections are based on use cases I ran into using LoRaWAN in AgTech. They're not a one size fit all at all. They may work for you or they may drain your battery and cause inconsistent performance. Some of the technological features of LoRaWAN stack are designed to support the original design premises we discussed. As deployment specification change, some of these features have to change as well. Mainly, I found the following features need some adjustments adaptive data rate, over-the-air activation, confirmed uplinks, cloud LoRa network servers, and the Semtech UDP packet folder. Let's focus on the first two and briefly cover the others. Adaptive data rate, I really want to love it, but I can't, not for AgTech. In ideal situation, it can decrease transmission power and increase energy efficiency. But when the transmitters are installed inside a tree foliage and the gateway is far away, in many cases, the gateway will hear the transmitters, but not vice versa. The transmitter will think it's not being heard 
and self-adjust to, to the, uh, its spread factor. And you end up with the maximum spread factor settings anyway. Over time, when, NDR is, when ADR is enabled, it may switch between the settings and this can cause packet loss until it returns to the maximum SF. Another issue with ADR happens when the technician arrives at the field. In many cases, he will first set up the gateway station. In many cases, the transmitters are already on and since they are near the gateway, they will switch to the lowest SF possible because of ADR. When the technician goes to install the transmitters in the field, unless he resets them, they might not work for a while, thus delaying the technician ability to verify the installation. Depending on a device manufacturer, it might take a while for the device to self-adjust to maximum transmission power NSF. So what's the solution? Just disable it. And here are some pro tips to survive without it. Most agricultural sensors require yearly or bi-yearly maintenance. So it's not a big deal for the technician to replace the batteries as well every one to three years since they visit the location anyway. Data loss and having to revisit remote loca location is a much bigger issue. Today, LoRaWAN transmitters score solar panels, large capacity batteries, and very efficient power operation. You'll be surprised how long your device can work on a single ER14505 $4 lithium battery, even at SF10. We've seen two-year battery life transmitting every 10 minutes using SF10 on US915. If you do want to try and use ADR to save the battery, try to enable it remotely after you observe the link quality and be specific for which transmitters you turn it on or off. If you do decide to install the transmitters with ADR enabled, reset them at location after install, as most devices would start at maximum SF and decrease as instructed by the LNS. Another feature I want to discuss with you is over-the-air activation. Does it work for AgTech? Before LoRaWAN, most proprietary RF stacks I ran into did not use encryption at all. So while LoRaWAN has encryption, OTA brings dynamic key switching, making the connection even more secure. It allows for a device to connect to different networks dynamically as well. Unfortunately, when a device fails to join a network, it cannot send sensor data uplink. For a join to succeed, a device has to send and receive a packet. This is a problem for AgTech where the devices do not receive packets well. Over their activation, so does it work for AgTech? If you compare a gateway ideally situated with a high gain raised antenna to a transmitter with a small antenna hidden in a tree, you will guess which one is the better receiver. When a device is unsuccessful in rejoining the network, it will eventually decrease to an attempt a day to conserve the battery. This will create gaps in data loss for your application. Here's the thing. If you look at the network server logs, you will see successful join attempts, join requests received, and join accept sent. The issue is that the end device does not receive the sent join accept, thus continuing to attempt to rejoin the network. Sure, you can add more gateways, but that's expensive. And you can try to improve the antenna and device installation, but that's not very practical. So what can be done? Easy, just switch to ADB mode of network join. By presetting the network keys in the device, you eliminate the join handshake process altogether. Device is pre-joined to the network. Device uplink packets are received from the gecko. No endless join cycles and the communication is still encrypted. From my experience, for sensor data, this is sufficient. If you are operating valves and wish to increase the network security, do use OTA for those devices. Usually, valves are placed in clear areas where antenna extension can be installed. Let's briefly review a few other suggestions I have to optimize the stack for AgTech. Confirmed uplinks. Since downlink reception is an issue, only use those for really important data streams. This will enforce the transmitter to rebroadcast the packet a few times. Listen before talk. I haven't really tested it enough, but it should be okay. Cloud-based network servers. 
If you're not using an embedded or local LNS, enable a packet buffer in your gateway. This is available in the basic station protocol and also in some manufacturers' firmwares. This will prevent packet loss when cellular connection is down. Adjust downlink in the LNS settings for the gateway. If you notice high latency in your gateway, some network servers such as the ThingStack will allow you to adjust the settings for the downlink packets. Plan for the worst case, SF10 or SF12 transmissions with a limited payload size. Calculate the battery life based on the SF10, SF12. Consider the smallest payload size will be sensed, so don't overload it with sensor data. Adjust your transmission interval, taking into account 30 to 40% packet loss. Install the gateway antenna as high as possible. Protect cables from animals. Install your transmitters at least at 1.5 meter height. Use external antenna on transmitters. It does make a difference in the hard spots. As we learned, LoRaWAN can be adjusted to work in AgTech deployments. With some modification, you can achieve a good packet success rate, long battery life, and consistent data performance, while still maintaining security and ease of deployment. There is a lot more to discuss about this subject, and I hope we get the opportunity to do that. Feel free to reach out in the chat and to connect on LinkedIn. Thanks everyone for participating in this conference, and I look forward to connect with you later.